Hi, I'm Roger Mishrad. At Franklin Templeton Investments, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the resources that can help make higher education more affordable. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868, Barnabas Health, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship, and by PSE&G committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Jackie Cook, on location for One on One. I'll be covering some of the films and events taking place at the second annual Montclair Film Festival. What a great lineup with over 85 films, special events, and special appearances. You never know who will show up. So come with me as I take you inside this entertaining and exciting week-long event. Iceberg Slim is the name that is synonymous with the pimp gang and wrote books that I grew up on. Runs the ladies, has the clothes, the jewelry. A lot of people think that pimps are dummies. That's not true. They're just perverted. Pimp had a big impact on the game. To give basic instructions of how to play the game. They were just fascinating. He really laid out how flamboyant and how fly his lifestyle can be. Was held in regard like an athlete or entertainer. It's a tough sport. In this book, I will take you, the reader, with me into the secret inner world of the pimp. Our guest masquerades under the name of Iceberg Slim. He continues to hide his identity. His books tell the truth about the life. Pimp was the first real black experience put into a book. Yeah, I checked it out. The P-I-M-P. Slim's writing is so vivid, he makes it all inescapable. He was incarcerated in Leavenworth. No more small towns for me. I was going to the city to get my degree in pimping. He really tells you where this pimp is from and what has made this pimp. He was more or less like a hero. He wanted that thrill of controlling a stable of women. What you do literally is play God. I'm here with a man who really needs no introduction, Ice-T, who's here at the film festival for your film, your documentary, Iceberg Slim, Portrait of a Pimp. For people who don't know, who is Iceberg Slim? Um, basically, he's a writer. Uh, he's one of the most uh, read writers after Alex Haley, black authors. And, uh, you know, he's very famous for writing books about, you know, the life of a pimp. Uh, he actually lived that life for a while, then he became a writer, and he tells these incredible stories about it. But, you know, in our culture today, you hear the rappers say Iceberg Slim, and nobody really knows who the man was. And I named myself after him uh, because I read all the books when I was growing up. But I, I, I still thought people really don't know this guy you know, really who this author is. So we did a documentary and we went in and showed you his true life. And uh, it's pretty enlightening. A lot, most people I know that thought they knew him have no idea about him. Well, you reading his books growing up, it really had an impact on your life. How so? When I was 15, well, really, when I was in high school, the cool cats would carry Iceberg Slim books around in their jeans. This was back in the day when they, we used to rock 501s. And, you know, part of your wardrobe was a Donald Goins book or an Iceberg Slim book in your back pocket. So you start to read these books, and this is written by, like, a 50-year-old man. So now I'm 17, 16, talking to the girls like a 50-year-old man. <laughs> so I had an advantage, you know? And, uh, you know... Like Chris Rock says in the movie, if you read this book, man, woman, you're going to learn all, all the lessons of life are in this book. 
because I break life down to a pimpo game. It's kind of like you either work for somebody or have somebody work for you. And, uh, you know, it's just a very interesting dynamic that goes on inside of this life and then when you translate it to our life. And so, um, you know, I got turned out by it. There's a, that's a word in the game. When you get turned out, when somebody totally blows your mind and changes your whole way of thinking, that's when you got turned out. Well, what are you hoping that the viewers take away from seeing this film? I know to get to know who this man was, but what else? Well, also, I think a lot of people think that these books are pro-pimping or pro, uh, uh, you know, the streets. And the, the, the man had no intent to that. These are warnings. And a lot of people listen to my music and think, oh, well, Ice-T's music is pro-gangster uh, or whatever. But if you listen to I'm Your Pusher, if you grew up on my music, I was the one telling you don't do drugs. I was the one saying don't go in the streets, you're going to die. I died in 90% of the end of my records. So my thing was like the game, but like I say, the B side of the game. And anyone who tells you anything about the streets and don't tell you about the pain and don't tell you about the death and don't tell you about the prison, they're lying or they haven't been there. So you can't really really talk about it without being honest. And that's what my agenda was, not to, to glamorize, but to show you just how raw it is and how difficult it is. You've had such a successful career and you've really mastered so many of the arts, music, acting, making, even writing books. So you have a book coming out next week as well. A couple Tell, of books. Yeah. Fourth book. Yeah, and that's coming out on Tuesday, right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that book. I wrote a book, uh, uh, I had a story called Kings of Vice and, um, you know, I just wrote a book. I mean, <laughs> the thing of it is, you could do pretty much anything. I mean, I just hit this. But being point. successful at it—that's that's at a whole nother level. Well, success is all relative. Right. I think success is just—I mean, if you're if you're somebody that don't think you can write a book, if you write a book, that's success. Right. So now, whether people like it, that's a whole nother thing. I mean, you know, my books—I'm not on New York Times bestsellers list, but I, you know. I mean, I just like to attempt things and, 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 and live the life, the little time that you're here. Why not? And I'm, I'm, I'm an inspiration to people because I'm like, yo, you can do it. I'm, my thing is, I'm not a rapper. I taught myself how to rap. I'm not an actor. I had never acted before New Jack City. Now I've been acting 20 years. I'm, I'm not a, a, a director, but I'm directing. And that's the thing. My manager directed this film. He told me I can't direct a film. I'm like... <laughs> You, you could, proved him wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could. I mean, you just have to surround yourself with experts that have done it before. If we wanted to open a restaurant, the key is find somebody who's done it before, and they'll teach you. No one is anything. You're taught it. And that's what I'm trying to show you. You can do anything if you're willing to put the work in. And all the things that you put your work into, what are you most proud of? Honestly, transition from the street life. Just, you know, that whole, that whole uh, element that was in my brain that, you know, like he says, street poison. When I was really, really negative and I was, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder and I felt that the only thing I could do was break the law. And when I finally realized that that wasn't the only thing I could do and I could put that behind me and, you know, change infamy for fame. And stay out of trouble. You know, you don't hear about ICE going to jail or getting in trouble. And I say that with a grain of salt because it can happen on the way out of here. You know, and when you're from the streets, the streets be pushing you. You know, you're not into the normal, you don't get down the way people do. Somebody says something to you, you want to take their head off. But now you're in the square world where you can't do it. So it's difficult. It's difficult. You just have to kind of like, yeah, you, you, you don't want, you lucky you didn't meet me a while ago. You'd be laid out. <laughs> <laughs> well, being, you know, you're a role model to a lot of people. And what does that title mean to you when people call you a role model? That people are modeling themselves after me. I think I'm an okay role model. I think you're a great role model. I don't think, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody wakes up. I think if you wake up wanting to be a role model, you're pretentious. I think if, if, you, if you model yourself after me, I'm a good role model. If you model yourself after some of the characters I play, those aren't good people. <laughs> you know, and I think Arnold Schwarzenegger could say the same thing. We, I play bad guys sometimes. But, yeah, I think, I mean, I've, ch I've changed a lot. Well, you put your life out there, a really personal life, you and Coco having your show, Ice Loves Coco. How has that reality show made people view you in a different light? I mean, we did, we did three episodes. We're not doing it anymore. I mean, I think the thing of it is, is at, with a reality show, 
you do it and then people kind of get an idea of like that's how you live then at some point it becomes like okay I don't want people to get bored so you you know I play video games Coco makes sandwiches we got Spartacus and my house is crazy and that's it okay bye back to our life you know and um it was an interesting experience but it's not the place to be if you're fake people will see through it they'll be like you you know but I don't know it was just we called it Ice Loves Coco because it was like I love Lucy because I'm like Ricky, you know, and, <laughs> and Coco's always got her crazy ideas. But I think right. people got a better understanding. They figured, you know, Coco was running around, you know, swinging off a stripper pole all day. And, you know, I'm loading guns. And that's not the truth. I'm playing that's video really games. Not. And <laughs> she's talking to me all day. <laughs> and finally, this is, this documentary, it's gotten great reviews. We're here to see it tonight. Yeah. Any other, seen it yet? no, I, I'm look, blow your mind. I, I'm, really, I'm excited. Really I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But are we going to see any more documentaries come come from your way? Maybe. I got an I got a couple of other other things I want to do. I'm talking about doing one about two female boxers I met in Brooklyn who are sisters that are world champions and can't get a fight because the the female boxing game isn't big. You know, Mayweather and them are getting hundreds of millions, but I think with the UFC right now, Exactly. Yeah, maybe female boxers will you know, women are different nowadays, you know what I'm saying? And a woman can box and still be sexy, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not like it was. So I thought about that, but I really want to direct features. I want to do my horror movies. I want to do my action movies. Even got some ideas for some kid movies, too, you know, because... I think I could talk to kids. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to whatever you have coming our way. You're always surprising us and, and putting out great stuff. Well, for the us. main thing with this is this is like getting my, my, my foot into the film business. And I wanted to do films that when people say, well, Ice T's doing a film, first time you heard I was doing a film, you're like, eh, what is it? Then you saw the art of rap, you're like, oh, okay. Right. After this, you'll go, okay. So somebody says, Ice got another movie, you're not going to roll your eyes. You're going to say, well, shoot, the last two were good and I'm gonna give it a chance. And that's how you have to edge yourself into this game. So I'm just working my way in. Well, we're looking forward to it. Dues. Of course, of course, but congratulations on the documentary. So nice speaking Thank with you, you. I appreciate right, cool. it. I'm here with George Hinojosa, who is the director, the producer of this film, Iceberg Slim, Portrait of a Pimp. Can you tell us a little bit about the film? Yes, the film uh, is about the life of Iceberg Slim, a.k.a. Robert Beck, who was a notorious pimp in Chicago in the early 1900s then came to Los Angeles to become a writer. Uh, he wrote seven groundbreaking books uh, that were the first of their kind that really set the world on fire and were of great importance to people like Chris Rock and Ice-T and Snoop Dogg and Quincy Jones and people like that. And I know Ice-T has been an admirer of Iceberg Slim for a really long time now. What made you guys decide to work on this project and get this documentary out there? Well, you know what? A few years back, there was a Screen Actors Guild strike that was looming. And in the past, those strikes had lasted for a very long time. So um, we wanted to figure out something that was going to fill potentially, you know, six, nine months worth of time. And... Um, this was the idea that we came up with. And then, of course, next week the strike ended and it was left to me to do the whole thing. So, Well, we'll talk about your involvement because I know we said director and producer, but it wasn't just that. Tell us about your total involvement in the film. Well, I mean, I financed the whole thing. Originally, Warner Brothers came to me and they said that they would finance it. And um, I was very appreciative of that, but I kind of felt like it would put too much pressure on me being a first-time director. And I wanted to be able to do it at the pace that I wanted to do it at. And I didn't want somebody saying, hurry up and finish it and hurry up and finish it. And so I decided not to take their money and just finance it myself so I could have creative control, which uh, made it that much more riskier for me, but I'm glad I did it that way. And you talked about how long, how long did it actually take to put this entire film together from start to finish? And what were some of the issues that you came across with, with trying to tell Iceberg Slim's story? Well, it took roughly about three years uh, and some change to get it done because I was also managing Ice-T and producing a television show, a couple of television shows, so it took quite a while. Um, I would say the hardest thing about uh, the doc was um, finding like archival footage that related to Iceberg Slim. Um, 
there was an interview that he did with Dick Cavett, for instance, that didn't exist anymore because they kind of, you know, didn't keep tape copies of it. Um, but then there were some incredible things that we found that we were just really blessed with. So it's a it's an up and it's an up and hill kind of battle. It's at the same time thrilling um, and terrifying. You've been working with Ice T for quite a while now, over 20 years, right? Yeah, 28 years. 28 years. And how did you first how did you first get together with Ice T? Well, I mean, I met Ice at a time when rap music people thought was a fad. In fact, when I went to record companies to get him record deals, they said, look, he's not talented, he's from the West Coast and only East Coast rap records sell, and it's a fad. So that's the climate that I met him under. But I had undying and unswerving belief in his talent and um, pushed really hard to get him a deal and actually met him when he came into uh, Island Records where I was working, a record label that had U2 and Grace Jones and people, and he was with a DJ looking for records. And I saw him and it was like, I saw everything he could be in that moment, so. What has been one of your most memorable m moments with Ice-T when it comes to the career side and the career aspect of everything? So many projects that you've worked on with him. Yeah, <laughs> you know, seeing him, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you, there, there's, oh, okay, I'm gonna run <laughs> Tough question, I'm mind. sorry. No, I'd love yeah. to hear him. <laughs> I remember when, we, when, I, when his record first came out on Sire Warner Brothers and we looked at the sales and we had sold 60,000 records and I was like, that's horrible. There's like 300 million people in America. And the person at the record company said to me, he's like, no, George, 60,000 records in a month is amazing. You've recouped what you've spent on the record. So you're in profit now. So I was like, holy crap, and I told Ice, and he was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, when it sells 100,000, we'll pop champagne. And sure enough, we sold 100,000 in like the next two weeks. And he goes, when we sell 200,000, we're gonna pop the champagne. We sold that really quick, and he goes, you know what? Let's just see how this goes, and then we're gonna pop the champagne. So <laughs> we're still waiting to pop that champagne. Oh, <laughs> um, another thing was is that we went to a test screening of New Jack City, which was his first um, movie role, where he was really acting. Yeah. And we sat in the back, and it was a packed theater. And the kids saw it, and they were screaming and hooting and hollering like it was a rock concert. We were like, oh my god, this movie is going to be a huge hit. And kind of being that fly on the wall, sitting next to him, experiencing that, and knowing that there was going to be this tidal wave of success in film and television, was, um, it was pretty beautiful, I have to say. That's amazing. And in this film tonight, this documentary, Iceberg Slim, what are you hoping the viewers take away from it? Well, I hope they go out and they buy the books. I hope this is a catalyst for the narrative of this man's life. Because, be because Ice-T actually introduced you to the books, yeah. is that correct? Right? Yeah, when I first started managing him, my first question was, why do you call yourself Ice-T? He goes, because of Iceberg Slim. Right. Right. And he gave me the books and that little fuse. And then, you know, seven books later in 28 years of quoting lines from those books back to each other, you know, here we up. Um, so I want a narrative to be made as a result of the popularity of this. Um, I want a ton of books to be sold, but I also want people to understand that this is a guy that turned his life around from circumstances that were truly horrific, coming from poverty, extreme racism, sexual abuse, and physical abuse, to do something that was very redemptive uh, and transformative. And so no matter where you're at, you can make that transformation. You don't have to go from being bad, but you can go from, you know, being ordinary to extraordinary. So that's what I hope people... I think that touches upon your story, too. You're such a success, and congratulations on the directorial debut, and, and we look forward to seeing it tonight. Thank you, George. So nice Thanks. to meet you. We're here with Federico Castelluccio, who you know from The Sopranos, but he's here tonight at the Moncler Film Festival debuting his film short. And what's that film short called? It's called Keep Your Enemies Closer, Checkmate. Tell us about or it. Vice versa. <laughs> Checkmate, Keep Your Enemies Closer. <laughs> um, well, it's, a, uh, it's an action thriller and uh, with, with a uh, kind of an unexpected twist. And I think uh, the, the title of the short series tonight is called The Unexpected, so it's apropos. And tell us about acting versus directing and the difference between the roles for you. Well, acting is, is really wonderful because uh, I really get to create a, create a believable character out of just words that people write. And sometimes I write them and I think about the characters. But uh, directing is, uh, is a little bit more, uh, in, there's a little bit more involved in it. There's, uh, you really have to understand and, and try to get a story across. Uh, and, and you have to have an idea and have to have kind of a vision 
and you know to see everything across. It's almost like really like painting because uh, when you're when you're looking at a blank canvas, you know you just kind of sketch it out and it becomes clear. Same thing with directing. I mean, you know you're using your your actors and as implements and uh, you know your your backdrop as uh, you know as color and uh, composition. You know everything everything. It's a true kinda, art. Form. Yeah, a true art form. It really is. They, I mean, they did call it moving pictures, right? Right, yeah. right. And, and you're a Jersey guy, and being here in Montclair tonight cool. and during this film festival with this week long event, what yeah. does that mean to you? Uh, it's great. It's great. Uh, I only live like you know 25, 30 minutes away from here. So, yeah. uh, growing up in Patterson, New Jersey, I mean, I, uh, I I look at look. I used to look up to people like um, like um, Luke Costello. I mean, and uh, my last name is Castelluccio. So there's a little bit of a, a thing there. You know, growing up in Patterson and uh, and uh, knowing that there was somebody that that had great success out of Patterson, New Jersey, and it was an Italian American. Uh, I was actually born in Italy, in Naples, Italy, and came came to this country when I was about three and a half, uh, back in 1968. So I just gave you my age. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look great. Don't worry well, thanks, about it. What, what can we expect next from you? I'm working on quite a few different projects. Uh, right now, I'm uh, getting ready to shoot uh, to direct a feature film called Lily of the Feast, based on a, on a short that uh, I shot a year and a half ago, and it uh, won quite a few awards in uh, different fest film festivals. Well, congratulations on the film tonight, and we know we're going to expect so much more out of you in the next coming months and years. Thank so, so thank much. you so much. It was such a pleasure thank to you. meet you. Hi, I'm Jackie Cook on location for One on One, and we're here at the screening of the film The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete. And with me is the director of the film, George Tillman Jr. George, tell us a little bit about what this film is, is about. Well, this film is about uh, Mr. He's a 14 year old kid, last day of school. Uh, his mom. Um, disappears and she never comes back so he's left with an eight-year-old kid who lives in the neighborhood that he doesn't have a great relationship with and there's a film about these two kids who don't normally have anything in common who finally finds himself needing one another over a course of a summer they got to survive without any electricity without any food trying to dodge the police so they don't get into the foster homes it's really about friendship and about survival and that's what this movie is about and it's a great story about what we learned about just never giving up in life and when the script fell into your lap, what made you fall in love with it? I think most of all, um, the relationships the, the, the between these two is a story that I normally don't see in Hollywood. And I felt like I see a lot of different scripts, and here's a project that I just don't see normally, and they tell a story in a situation that we don't really hear about a lot, and that would really attract to me as a director. And let's talk about the powerhouse cast that you have. Two American uh, American Idol alumni, right? Jennifer yep. Hudson and Jordan Sparks. Yep. How was it working with both of them? And tell us how Jordan and uh, both and Jennifer really prepared for this role. It was in it was interesting. I didn't know until later that they both were from you know from <laughs> American Idol. It just kind of worked itself out. I just felt like Jennifer really she plays a mom who has a lot of issues she has an addiction uh, a heroin addiction and she really wanted to dig deep and not really let people see for who they know her as Jennifer Hudson but as the character so there's a lot of preparation a lot of time spent talking about addiction talking about moms in this situation um, Jordan Sparks also plays a character who's from the projects in Brooklyn as well so a lot of this is really really is being bringing reality to the story to, to the ideal of what really goes on in real life and that's really what the preparation was like it was the same way with anthony mackie um, same way with Je uh, jeffrey wright and also alicia keys coming involved with the music um it was us was trying to get it right and make it feel real brought a cereal and milk and everything. Take the card and go to the store. I told you, do what the store took it. You have to go get it. I circled the ones you could do. They probably don't care about background checks. This is what you think of me? I wasn't about to circle rocket scientists if that's what you mean. <laughs> Mister, what's your problem? My problem? I'm the one with the problem? You gonna stop talking to me like I'm your damn child. I'm your mother. You think I'm satisfied with this life? I'm not. I'm just trying to get things in order. You been saying that for how long now? I'm sick of hearing that. You know what I'm sick of? I'm sick of you. You and your smart ass mouth. 
You keep on talking. I'm gonna kick your nappy head ass out for good. What's the difference? I'll be better off. That's what I'm talking about. You just know everything, don't you? Don't you? And you had two young actors on this film who were brilliant, and one of them was Skylin Brooks, right, who, yep. who played Mister. Yep. Tell us a little bit about him. You know what's so interesting, I saw a short film that he did. He did a short film uh, that was amazing, and he, the only thing about it, he didn't talk in the short film. So I was always wondering, can he really act and say the words? He came into the audition, he was great, he was amazing. Interesting, that same audition, um, Ethan Dazan was there as well, who plays Pete. And they were like 20 minutes away from each other through audition. So I put them in the room together. Immediately, these two guys had chemistry, and I felt like it was faith that these guys were the part where it was right for the part. And, and you've directed many other films that we know very well, like Barbershop and Men of Honor. How is directing this film different than films you've done in the past? Um, yeah, I mean, with Soul Food and Men of Honor and The Tories, those films were bigger budgets than Hollywood. Uh, films, but this is something where I love telling stories where it's dealing with real people, real issues. At the same time, a film that can make you cry, make you laugh, make you emotional, and then you walk away with something, that's what filmmakers will love, and that's what attracted me to this material. So that's what I try to strive in all the material and all the films that I do. And what is it about independent filmmaking and film festivals like this one, the Montclair Film Festival, that are important to the film community and the local community as well? Well, it's great because in the, in, the, in the festivals, you get to have interaction with the audience who see your films. You get to talk to them. You get to see what they feel about the movie. You get to hear Q&As. You know, with films that come out in Hollywood, you know, there's no way you can go to uh, Kansas City where your film is screening. And you kind of feel you know, disconnected at the same time. This film and, and, and the festivals make you feel connected. You get to meet other filmmakers. You get to see what, what the public want to see. And I think that's a great thing as a filmmaker to keep you in touch with your audience. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and the Montclair Film Festival, 13 for WNET, and NJTV. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, Bloomfield College, Barnabas Health, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, and by PSE&G. Promotional support provided by The Record and NorthJersey.com and The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.